Good morning, everyone. That was some really amazing didge or uh, yadaki playing this morning, and um, I hope you feel a little bit more connected to country. I always close my eyes and listen to the yadaki, and for me, it's that sounds of the earth. So I invite you to do that next time you hear someone. Look, you possibly won't ever hear someone playing didge as good as that, but next time you do hear someone, I invite you to listen to it that way. So good morning, ladies, gentlemen, elders, dignitaries, and colleagues. I'd like to begin by paying my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to elders past, present, and future emerging generations. Thank you for your warm welcome and the invitation to speak today. Um, a special thanks goes to my friend and colleague, Kylie Ward. I am a proud Narunga Ghana woman, which means I grew up in South Australia, on Point Pierce Mission, in fact, and the slide just shows you a little arrow to the place that I grew up. And I see myself as a pretty ordinary person. In fact, every time I step on stage, I hold my breath and step out here with bravery. I'm sure many of you have been behind one of these podiums, you know, acknowledge that no matter how brave you are, there's a bit of vulnerability that happens when you step up here. And um, you'll understand why I've made that statement, hopefully, by the end of my talk today. So when I was a young girl, I realised I wanted to become a nurse after seeing my family members suffer traumatic experiences at the hands of the health system. And of course, it was because of my positive encounters with nurses. While I've worked in many different roles that you've heard about across the health system, clinically, in program development and delivery, in academia and in policy, I am now very, very pleased and proud to be leading the Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives, or CATSNAM, which is a bit easier. I'm proud to be an advocate for the unique and powerful roles that Indigenous nurses have in the health system and in their communities as agents of change. So you'll not be surprised at all to learn that I'm really delighted to see your conference theme today, which is Make Change Happen. This topic is central to our work at Cats and M, where so much of what we do is about creating change to ensure that there is a culturally safe health system at all levels. And this will be the focus of my speech, us, the nursing profession, as agents of change and cultural safety, embedding it into our health system. So, what is cultural safety? Cultural safety, as I'm sure you know, is something quite different to the term we often hear, which is cultural awareness. Cultural awareness focuses on Aboriginal people as being different or othering us. The gaze is outward and there is often an assumption that there's a how-to guide to treating Aboriginal, and there's also an assumption that Aboriginal people are all the same. Here, Tyndale's map, of which shows us over 300 different Aboriginal languages, shows us that we're not homogenous. Like in non-Indigenous Australians, we are unique, and therefore there is no cookie-cutter approach, and there's no how-to guide or tick list. Cultural safety, on the other hand, requires us to reverse our gaze so that we examine our own beliefs, behaviours and practices, as well as such issue, issues as is institutional racism. To become aware of what we don't normally see, examining if we, within our structures, within our health systems, we have leadership or governance structures that include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. According to the Māori nurse who developed the concept of cultural safety, the, doctor, uh, the late Dr Irahapiti Ramsden, cultural safety requires a profound understanding of the history and social function of racism and the colonial process. Put simply for me, it is about an understanding of how the foundations of power dynamics in this country was laid down at first contact and their intergenerational impact. Cultural safety, most importantly, puts the power for determining whether care is culturally safe in the hands of the recipient of that care. Cultural safety is a means to challenge racism at personal and institutional levels and to est establish trust in healthcare encounters. Making change happen is not only a professional preoccupation for me, but it's something that's also very, very close to my heart. Creating big picture change requires all of us to think beyond our professional roles and identities and to step up as individuals, as people who are prepared to make a deep personal commitment to the hard work that is involved in creating change. 
the rainbow is implied. <laughs> when I think about why we make change happen and how we can achieve this individually, collectively and systemically, three people come to my mind. Their stories are very different, they come from very different places and different times, and yet their stories all highlight the potential that ordinary people have to contribute to extraordinary change. To visit these people, and in the spirit of this conference, and because I'm an 80s tra tragic, we're going to go back to the future. Firstly, let's go back. The first person on my mind is a woman by the name of May Yarrowick. May trained as an obstetric nurse in Sydney in 1903, and she may well be our very first Indigenous nurse qualified in Western nursing. Let's not forget, however, that Indigenous people were performing the roles of nurses, midwives and healers for tens of thousands of years before the first Western School of Nursing was established in Australia. Let us take a few moments to reflect upon the challenges that May must have overcome to train and work as a nurse in the early years of the 20th century. Remembering that this was just a few years after the new Federation of Australia had passed the Immigration Restriction Act of 1901. This legislation enshrined what we call the White Australia Policy, embedding dominant culture worldviews and priorities into the very birth of the Federation, and excluding from us, uh, sorry, and excluding us as in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people from Australia's birth certificate. It was a time when anything other than European thinking was less than. Hence, Aboriginal people, as you may or may not know, for many years were a part of the Flora and Fauna Act, and eugenics at that time was really, really popular. Some might say that to this day, Australia has not grown out of these views. Too often, the limitations of dominant cultural worldviews stop non-Indigenous people from recognising the incredible strengths of our Indigenous peoples and cultures. And this, um, this newspaper article here actually points out that Aboriginal people were the first people in the world to actually discover axes, and that we've definitely been here for 65,000 years. That May was able to achieve her dreams and become a nurse in this area in which she lives speaks volumes about her extraordinary achievement and, I must add, the ordinary people who helped her. Her story also serves as a powerful call to action for us all. The profound impact that May had in being that first nurse means that we now have over 2,000 Aboriginal nurses in Australia. Let us not forget that for more than a century after May Yarrick broke through those barriers to achieve her dreams, too many of my colleagues, Indigenous nurses and other Indigenous health professionals alike, continue to find their workplaces culturally unsafe. The racism that many of my colleagues experience as a part of their daily working lives is a critical barrier for the recruitment and retention of Indigenous nurses. And we know that we need to grow our workforce if we are to improve the health and wellbeing of our people. The second person I'd like to introduce to you today is Professor Moana Jackson, a truly inspirational Māori leader. Professor Jackson was one of the supervisors of the lady that I spoke about earlier, Dr Ramsden and her PhD, that developed the concept of cultural safety. And indeed, he writes in her thesis that he saw cultural safety as a means for addressing power imbalances. All those years ago, he drew links between cultural safety and wider Māori aspirations of sovereignty, a linkage that remains extremely relevant in the current Australian context. When I first met Professor Jackson two years ago, he challenged us at Cats and M to see beyond the mountain, to vision our future at all costs, and to be brave, because that's the way of our people. He also reminded us that we are storytellers, hence I'm up here talking to you. In issuing that call to action, I'm sure he started many of us on journeys both individually and collectively, strengthening our resolve and our determination and helping us all to lift our gaze beyond the here and the now to the big picture for the coming generations. For the organisations and members of Cats and Am, Professor Jackson's words are providing a transformative call to action. We are looking beyond the mountain and developing stories about a future that we want to see for our children and their children. Professor Jackson's words actually inspired me in a recent speech to the National Rural Health uh, Conference in Cairns to imagine the world in 2037 as we would like to see it. So now let's go to the future. And you're going to do some calculations straight away. 
I'm 62. <laughs> um, and I'm looking and feeling good um, because of my strength in my identity. And I don't know if Susie's here, but because of my monthly treatment to my clear complexions clinic with my RN Lisa. Um, look, it's a future where our grandchildren are reading stories and textbooks that are written by Indigenous people and are attending universities that are led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander scholars. On the other side of this mountain, our grandchildren are learning from Indigenous teachers and lecturers and television presenters. And they are proud and strong in their identities because of how and what they are learning. Self-determination is not an aspiration or even a dream for my great-grandchildren. It is their daily reality. Our grandchildren and their non-Indigenous friends share in learning local language and they learn together about the importance of respecting and caring for country. They grow up knowing about whose country they were born on because this is written on their birth certificates and it's a part of their identities from the day they are born. On the other side of this mountain, our grandchildren and their non-Indigenous friends grow up knowing always to be conscious of whose country they are on. The signs, GPS reminders and names on our maps and roads also remind them of this. On the other side of the mountain, our grandchildren are growing up in a society that values them and their heritage. They are growing up with intergenerational hope rather than intergenerational trauma. They believe that they can be anything they want to be. And guess what? They can. My grandchildren are learning about the tremendous achievements of our first Indigenous Prime Minister. Who, was, who's, who would be your first Indigenous Prime Minister? Well, I'm in Sydney, and mine is Mr Adam Goods. From their classrooms, they hear the discussions from the First Nations Parliament. Their chances of getting sick or dying prematurely are no greater than that of their non-Indigenous friends. If they do get sick, it's likely that they'll be treated at a health service led by Indigenous executives and a large proportion of Indigenous nurses. In 2037, I no longer feel that I need to put on my heavy armour when I venture outside of my home. It's a far cry from 20 years ago when this armour was a part of my defence system against everyday insults of unconscious bias born of racism. Experiences such as deflecting or swallowing hard when I hear, gee, you've done well for yourself, or you're too pretty to be Aboriginal, or yes, but you're not like the rest of them, you're different. In 2037, I know that when non-Indigenous people see me in the street or at work, their first reaction will not be of prejudice or fear, but of gratitude and pride. By 2037, cultural safety is no longer something that health professionals need to learn as a part of their education and training. It is embedded into our Australian way of life. From early ch childhood learning to the conversations around the kitchen, kitchen table to the wider public discourse. By 2037, the wider health system has woken up to the strengths of our ways of doing business, our ways of healing through our nunkeries and the innovative models and governance and service delivery such as the Aboriginal community controlled health sector. Now, you would never find a politician, let alone a prime minister, who would regard Aboriginal people living on country as a lifestyle choice. In a similar vein, by 2037, wider society has come to understand the many be benefits of centering Indigenous knowledges and ways of doing business at a time when transformation has been so urgently needed in the face of climate change. Meanwhile, back to the present. My point is that we all need to develop that shared big picture vision for the future. We all need to be able to see and enact our roles individually and collectively. Our profession, the largest health workforce, has a profound potential in creating that future for our children and our grandchildren. I was so delighted to have the opportunity to recently meet Professor Moana Jackson again um, at the Indigenous Nurses Conference in Auckland, which happened earlier this month. He impressed upon us the importance of encouraging and supporting ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That holding of the breath, that stepping forward with purpose, that being brave. As I look around the room at you all today, I wonder how many of you think of yourselves as ordinary people, but I'd like you all to imagine yourselves as being capable of doing extraordinary things. I'd like you to imagine yourselves as disruptive agents for positive change, working towards transforming the health system so that cultural safety is not just embedded within it, 
but so that the health system becomes an agent for the wider embedding of cultural safety across society. Nurses are famous for their collective commitment to social change and social justice. I'm forever grateful that nursing organisations organization such as the ACN and colleagues supported the establishment of Cats and M some 20 years ago now. I would love for you all now, as individuals, professionals and organisations, to stand with Katzenham as we advocate for cultural safety to be embedded across law, policy, practice and systems. In particular, we want to see cultural safety, safety strongly embedded in the national safety and quality health service standards, gee that's a mouthful, so that all health services are assessed and accredited against this standard. Cultural safety, I would argue, is just as important as clinical safety. If a health professional, a service, a policy or a system is culturally unsafe, then it's not an abstract concept for Indigenous peoples. It means our health, our social, emotional and spiritual wellbeing will be at peril. We know that it makes us sick. I'm sure that many of you here today would like to be a part of a health system that supports rather than damages the health and wellbeing of Indigenous colleagues and clients. I'm sure that many of you here today have the capacity to achieve extraordinary things. But what does it take for ordinary people to achieve extraordinary things? The single most important attribute I would suggest to you today is perseverance. Perseverance can be extremely intelligent, but sorry, people can be extremely intelligent, but still fall short of success if they do not persevere. People in positions of power can be disempowered and often will not achieve their goals without extraordinary perseverance. People who persevere can achieve great things and often from difficult positions and with limited resources if they have the grit and determination to carry on, to keep pushing over the mountain. And this is my meme that I included this morning for what perseverance means to me. <laughs> and so I come to the third person I'd like to introduce to you this morning. Clinton Pryor. He's an Aboriginal man from Western Australia. And since the 8th of September last year, um, when he left Perth, Clinton has been an on an extraordinary journey, working right across this vast continent. He's walked from Perth to Alice Springs and Adelaide to Melbourne and Sydney and is now on his final leg to Canberra. When he began his journey, he was walking to draw attention to the threatened com uh, closure of communities in remote Western Australia. As he walked, he listened to elders and others in many communities. He shared some of his own story, including the utter loneliness and abandonment he felt when he was homeless. Clinton has heard many other story, people's stories about the commonality and the injustices that Indigenous people continue to face in this country. His journey has become an extraordinary beacon, providing inspiration, strength and vision to many other people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike. People have been following him, him on his journey across social media and that's included the New York Times and the BBC, in fact. When he arrived into Redfern, Clinton urged the hundreds of people who gathered there to meet him to be a part of making change happen. He said, we as human beings have the right to protest and the best way to get justice is when we come together as one. It's about time we start getting justice and it's about time we're making things right for everybody and moving this country forward. At this point, I hope that some questions are beginning to grow in your minds, your hearts and spirits. I hope that one of these questions might be, how can I be a useful ally for my Indigenous colleagues in creating justice? This graphic here gives some useful leads. It was prepared by the Coalition of Groups in the Water Protectors Campaign, you might know about that, at Standing Rock, who are fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. So what I'm asking you today is, will you stand in solidarity with us at Katznam? We'd love to see your support individually and collectively for a National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Authority, the embedding of cultural safety into health practitioners legislation, and we know this already happens because it happens in New Zealand, to examine your structures for Indigenous leadership, governance and roles. We want a dedicated national Indigenous workforce strategy and continued funding for Cats and M. And we'd also like you to consider to becoming uh, a, a, a member of Cats and M to support the work that we do. And if you look at our website, you'll find the details there. And it's free. There's not too many things you get in life that's free anymore. So most importantly, will you stand in solidarity to, pack, to tackle some really big issues with us against racism, 
in all of its forms, wherever and whenever you see it. Individually seek out cultural safety training and understand that cultural safety is a lifelong journey. And join with us in convincing the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare to prioritise cultural safety with the same determination and consistency which they apply to clinical safety. You can do this via a submission or a letter of support to us. As I think of the people I've introduced to you this morning, the trailblazing May Yarrowick, the visionary Professor Moana Jackson, the courageous and determined Clinton Pryor, I'd like to encourage you to find something of yourself in their stories. Their stories remind us that ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things when they approach tasks, difficult tasks, with determination, perseverance and the right heart attitude. I'd like, to, you to, uh, I'd like to encourage you to join with us in blazing a trail with courage and determination and with transformative vision for the future. And now, as we contemplate how we might move forward together, I'd like to end by introducing you to someone else. You might know him, his name's Peter Norman, and he's the guy there on the end without his arm extended. This photo was taken at the 1968 Olympics when two American uh, track stars burn an indelible mark on the conscience of America with their black power salute. It was a strong symbolic gesture taking a stand for African American civil rights. Norman was an Australian who arrived in the 200 metres after defying great odds. In fact, he made an Australian record that stood for 47 years. That's a long time. At the awards ceremony, Norman supported the American athletes. He took a stand, a public stand for human rights at a time when this was not popular. He paid a heavy price. He was omitted from the 1972 Summer Olympics teams despite qualifying 13 times in the 200 metres, 13 times and five times for the 100 metres. Back in Australia, he and his family said openly that he was treated as an outcast and he was not invited to participate in the 2000 Olympics. In 2012, the Australian Parliament approved a motion to formally apologise to Norman and rewrite him into history. My point is that often it's not easy to stand up for human rights, to stand against racism. Sometimes you pay a cost but ultimately it's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. And when human rights are upheld, it's to everyone's benefit. Let us remember that history is not something that happens in the past. It's happening right now and we're all making history right now. The decisions we make, the paths we follow, the stories we make, whether we are deliberately choosing to create extraordinary, even if we consider ourselves pretty ordinary people, these decisions all have a flow on effect to the future for our children and our grandchildren. Please join us, work with us and support us in our journey, in our journey towards creating an extraordinary future. Thank you.